game tank in the grid. Get them! I should never have written all those tank programs. Walt Disney's Tronin. As you probably know, many of the images in that film were generated using computer graphics. But if you thought that was clever, just have a look at this. Well, that short clip is an extract from a film called The Works, being made by computer graphics artists at the New York Institute of Technology. The film has no live action at all. Every image is entirely computer generated, but presumably in, not in a micro like this. No, they had to use a mainframe to do that. And because of the complexity of each image, they had to take them one at a time and then put them all together to make the finished film. So that's why it runs so smoothly and no jerks and so quickly. Yes, but... Nevertheless, we can do something like that, even on our little micro. You remember our little man the from a few man. programs back? Right. Well, let's develop that idea a bit. Here we've got a different program, and um, it's a loop. The interesting line is line 30. And what we're going to do here is to move from the left-hand side of the screen to the right-hand side of the screen, and we're going to print the little man, which I've already defined as character 224, and we're going to immediately behind him put a space so that as he moves across he'll wipe out the previous image and we'll get some kind of animation effect. Let's uh, run it and we can see. There he goes. Well you can see it's not very, uh, it doesn't fool the eye very much, it doesn't even move his legs. Oh no, but we can, we can do better than that. Um, the same idea though. Here goes our little man and this is just a series of different images rather than the one that we had before. And he's now going to do a forward somersault with Pike. <laughs> there he goes. And so smooth it doesn't even splash. <laughs> Indeed. Well, but you may have just noticed, with a small image like that, even there we have a tiny bit of blank space as each frame is computed. And so, to, to get better than that, if we're going to do big images, we have to change the technique slightly. And let me load up um, a different program and show you um, a different approach to the problem. Now, the computer now is drawing for us a cat on the screen. A black cat in a coal hole. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's shine a light on it, and there we can see the cat. Now, what I've done, that cat was drawn in black, and when I, as it were, shone a light on it, what I really did was say to the computer, what you've just drawn in black, change that to white. Let's switch it off again, turn it back to black, and now we'll draw another cat next to it. Now, Normally, of course, you wouldn't see this or you'd do this before you ran the program because it's impossible to wait for this kind of uh, drawing in between animation frames. It would look very slow and not very convincing. Yes, but now that we've got the cat, let's do what we did with the first cat, wipe it out. And we've still got the first cat there, so if we now animate them, black to white and white to black, we can make the cat jump. Just to prove we've got two cats, let me show you. There's the first cat in red. And there's the second cat in green. I see. And is it very complex to write this sort of software? Yeah, it's fairly difficult to write the, the software itself, but the idea behind it is, is quite easy. Let me show you. 
let's um, print cat in white. Now, if I change colour into colour 1, which on this computer is red, let's do the same thing again. Print cat. And there it is in red. And we'll change colour again to colour 2, which is green. And let's print cat again. Now that's all very straightforward. What's clever is this. We use a command which on this computer is VDU19. On other computers it's something like pen and ink. Um, and what that does, it says whatever you've done in a particular colour, change it to another colour. So we're going to say change colour 1, which is red here, to black, which is naught. And then we add another naught because that's the way the command uh, works. And when I press return, you'll see the red turns to black. And in effect, it's disappeared. And I can do the same thing with the green cat. I can change that one to, which is colour 2, and I'm going to change that one to colour 7, which is white. And that has now gone to white. And you can see, by alternating black and white, we can create the effect that we've just had with the jumping cats. And would you be limited just to two images? No, it, we can do as many images as we've got colours to draw these different hidden characters. Um, let's move on and I'll show you um, another programme. And whilst this is loading, you can see it filling up the screen. The reason for that is that these pictures are stored as numbers. And I've stored a whole screen full of pictures on the disk, and I've transferred the numbers back into the computer, and we create an instant image on the screen. Now, this doesn't look very exciting at the moment. It's a couple of globes, and you can see here, um, we've got different colour lines drawn on. Blue, magenta, dark blue, yellow. That one's black and white flashing. And what I'm going to do now is to change the colours one at a time to a foreground colour and all the others will become a background colour. It's quite impressive, isn't it? It's very good, isn't it? So that's simply changing all those colours to either dark blue or light blue to get that spinning effect. Yes, it is. But the thing about this is it's one image and we're stuck with that one picture. To go further than that, we have to uh, take this idea of colour switching on just a bit beyond. Let's load up another programme. And here we have a picture of an owl. And what I'm doing here is drawing each new position of its wings, and I'm rubbing out the previous one using the same idea of switching to the background colour. It's not very fast, though, is it? No, it's, uh, it does need speeding up to be realistic. But that's written in BASIC. What I've done is also write it in machine code, and let's switch on the machine code, and there you can see that's really rather much better. And that's talking directly to the central processing unit rather than having to go through the basic interpreter which of course takes time as the program is running. Of course equally you could have written it in basic and used a compiler which would compile it once and for all into machine code and then run that and you'd have had a similar sort of speed up. Yes we could have done that. Excellent. Well, thank you. And, well, the owl only used 11 pictures, and to make it more realistic on cartoon animation, an artist would draw all the positions in between. Of course, it's possible to use a computer to do this, even between quite unrelated pictures. technique was actually called in betweening. Let me show you on our micro. I'm going to load up a program here and I've done a drawing of an egg and I'm going to turn that into a chick. Let's start it off. Now what the computer is doing, it's working out all the different points on the egg, how they compare with the same points on the chick and then moving them across from one to the other. And again on this program we're using the um, colour switching idea so that you don't actually see the drawing taking place. We're nearly there now. There we are, and it's finished. Great, I like your chicken, and also like your owl. How are you getting these drawings into the computer? Well, I'm not much of an artist, but let me show you how it's done. Ah, oh, you're copying. <laughs> well, here's a very inexpensive piece of equipment. All we've got is a flat board and an arm here. At the end of the arm, there's a 
little stylus that tells me where I'm actually drawing. At the elbow joint and at the pivot here, there's a couple of variable resistances and there the values from those are fed into the computer and with the right bit of software we can then calculate where the, the stylus is both in the vertical position and in the horizontal. So let's just have a go at drawing a bit of the owl. There's his back and a bit of the tail. I took a bit more care when I drew the previous one but I think you can get the idea and here's a bit of a wing and round and so on. There you can see it's the beginnings of the owl. That's terrific. Well, that's a nice, inexpensive piece of equipment. Let's go to the other end of the scale. Here we've got something rather more sophisticated. Um, in fact, it costs about the same as the uh, computer. Video camera, if you'd like to stand in front of it and let me take your photograph. Now, in fact, what's happening, the image from the video camera is going through into this magic box of tricks and the points of brightness in the picture are being transformed into numbers and then they're being sent down into the computer and here comes your picture. Well the first thing we ought to do is to set a threshold level which means anything above a certain value is going to be white and everything below it is going to be black. Now let's uh, enlarge the picture, here it comes and you can see all the various dots, black and white dots and there we are, it's not, in a, not a bad picture of you at That's all. That's not bad at all. Of course, once it's in the computer, you could transmit it across the world and people could see my image on other computers, I guess, and you could use it for all sorts. It's rather a lot of fun, isn't it? Oh, yes. It, you're just really, at that point, you're limited by your imagination. Well, for now, thanks a lot, Ian. Well, you probably aren't going to be using your micro to create the son of Tron, but one of the most important uses of computer graphics is in design. And over here, we have a computer-aided design that, system that runs on an ordinary micro. It's controlled by this joystick here. There are actually quite a number of controls in this. You can move it in any direction. You can actually turn this and this will enable me to select a larger or smaller part of the screen and there are three control buttons here which will enable me to select various things on the menu. Well, we've got a house here and we can look at it in much more detail by positioning this cursor on and either zooming in or out onto a section we're going to deal with. This one is going to be the dining room so we'll zoom in on that and it will redraw it in a much larger scale. Well currently the popular method of designing the interior of a house is to take pre-printed sheets like this and transfer these onto the actual drawing of the house and you can get baths and so on and total furnishings. The disadvantage is that you're limited to what's on the sheet, you can run out of them and you're limited to the actual designs there. We have those similar designs stored inside the computer and of course you can extend these to any number that you want. We'll pick them out and have a look at some and I'm going to actually position some furnishings in this drawing. Here at the top we've got a sofa there, two, two seater there and chair and tables here, table and chairs there. So we can position the cursor over that and select it. And it'll go back to my plan of my dining room and I can position that there in my dining room. Like that. And it will immediately draw it in position and I could very quickly position another one alongside it if I wanted to have a number of them. We can then go back to the main plan of the house and have a look at that and we simply select page and we're back at the plan of the house and we can see those actually there in the dining room itself and there they are being drawn. But of course what we're seeing on the screen is much less than the actual detail that's held in the computer itself and we can see this by zooming in and I select zoom and this is the part that I think is absolutely magic. And we can position the cursor there very tightly on that window. We can see there's something curious in that window. And we simply zoom in on it. And it's immediately redrawn. And we get a close-up of the window. And there in the window is a globe. And it's actually a map of the world. And that gives a fair amount of detail, but I might say that I'd like to look even closer at that and I can position this cursor right in there, if I can get it in, right there over where I think England is. I'll position it over England and it should then draw England. Of course, all the detail is held inside the machine itself and there's England. Now, I actually happen to have a cottage up in North Wales, somewhere up there, and if I position the cursor carefully over it, Maybe I can actually see if it's still there. And there's the 
Clane Peninsula, and there indeed is the cottage. And what is even more incredible, I can still keep going and have a look in that dormer window up there. With a bit of luck, I might even find that there's a globe in the window, and indeed there is, but this time it's in the other window. I looks as if I could go on zooming in forever if I wanted to. But actually I'm not zooming in, I'm just going through various levels of information. And actually it's quite important to do that because we can print out the, what we've got on the screen in much greater detail than we can actually show. Well, this is a real application for microcomputer graphics. There are hundreds of these installed and in use in drawing offices throughout the country. It's cheap and it's easy to use. Now, it may look complicated to design a house, but it's nothing like as difficult as designing something we all take for granted. The craft of making shoes really hasn't changed much over hundreds of years. Essentially, a flat piece of leather is stretched round a mould or a last, and the sole is either nailed or glued on the bottom. But the problem today is that fashion changes extremely rapidly, and it demands a much more complex shoe design being produced very, very quickly. But the method of making a modern shoe really hasn't changed much from the old traditional way. First, all the separate pieces of leather are cut out using specially shaped knives. Then they're stitched together to form the upper part of the shoe. Finally, the upper part is carefully stretched over the last and stuck onto the sole. Computers aren't yet used in the manufacturing process, but clerks are experimenting with their use in design. Eventually, this could replace the present method. First of all, the designer has to rough out a sketch of what he expects the shoe to look like. Then, they take a fairly standard sort of last and cover it with thin plastic very closely. And then the design of the shoe is transferred onto this plastic. But it's now possible to hold that three-dimensional representation of the last in a fairly powerful mini-computer and bring it up on a screen in full colour like this. And using a graphics tablet and a pen, it's quite possible to design a shoe directly into the computer itself. Well, first we can draw lines of any shape. You just position the cross wherever we like and then draw a line, and that's the top of the shoe. And we can see that a little bit better if I put some design down here on the front here. I think we'll have... Um, perhaps a nice little pattern here. Any shape will do. This is pure artistry. And we are designing in three dimensions, so I simply touch mirror and it will put the same line on the other side. And any true designer would, of course, sign his, his work and I can do a, a uh, signature of it. And just to be sure what's happening on the other side, that it really is working, I can quickly have a look by simply um, redraw it from the other side. So it really proves it's actually in three dimensions. It's absolute magic the way it does it. Well, that's the end of the styling phase. Now I can get into what's called the art phase, where we're using full colour. I can display on the screen here 256 colours out of a possible total of 16 million, so there's hardly any colour that I can't possibly select. Some of them are pretty wild. I've always wanted a blue shoe, so I think I'll start off with a nice, deep blue. And all I have to do is to put the cross over it, press the pen on the graphics tablet, and still keeping the shading, it'll shade the whole shoe. Except the areas that are circled in my little pattern. It's just magic. Now all I've got to do to colour the rest is to pick various colours, say a nice red like that, and put it over the area I want to colour, and it will fill in that area. And I can keep on doing that, I pick another colour, perhaps a nice bright yellow. I have that one, and I think I need some green. And I think in there. And that's my shoe complete. <laughs> it's a dandy. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, once the design's been finalised, the patterns have to be made from which the leather is cut. And using the system, it's fairly straightforward. This plastic is put through a mangle and flattened out. But making one of these for every size of shoe would be very laborious. But of course, on the computer, the process is exactly the same. The computer itself flattens out the pattern 
but it can produce without any effort one for every different size. Well, for some reason, they declined to put that shoe into production. The 3D image was created by the computer using a large database of information about what shoes look like from various viewpoints. But what can we do on a micro, Ian? Well, Mac, on the micro, we can work in three dimensions as well. If we look at our model of the house here, what we're going to ask the computer to do is to draw for us this shed here in three dimensions. And the way it's going to tackle the problem, it's going to take an imaginary point in the middle of the shed and calculate the distances between the center and each of these corner points and then reproduce that on the graphic screen. Here we've got it working for us and let me just point out to you at the bottom we've got the time that it's taking to draw each picture and as you can see we're running at about a second a picture. Now that's a wireframe image just like the model and it's a bit confusing. What it would be nice to do was to, would be to make it look more solid. And we can ask the computer to calculate for us which faces, which walls are in front and which are behind and only draw the ones in front. That's called hidden line removal. As you can see, that takes about twice the amount of time to do that calculation. Let's go back to our wireframe and add a second object. We'll add a chimney. There comes the chimney, and again, we'll ask the computer to do hidden line removal for us. It takes much longer now to calculate. We'll see the time coming up. You can see it's drawing now the parts that are behind, and that's taking nine seconds around there to do that calculation. Now, another approach um, is to do what we could call overpainting. And on that computer over there, We've, we're doing that. What's happening is it's starting at the back left-hand corner of the image and it's gradually moving forward. And as you can see, when it moves forward, it overpaints the picture behind and we get this three-dimensional image being produced. Mm -hmm. We can do very much the same kind of thing on our house. And here comes the colored house and it's going to draw a new picture for us and rotate it round. Now we can do with this image, we can do really something very much like we saw in Tron at the beginning of the program. We can take a picture of each of these images, add them together and we can make our own cartoon film. Thank you, Ian. Not at all bad, really. But I don't think Walt Disney's got too much to worry about yet. Next week, in the last programme in this series, we'll be looking at ways of connecting the micro to other computers via the telephone system, and we'll be attempting to send you some free software during the programme, and it'll be worth about what you're going to pay for it. So have a cassette recorder handy. Till then, goodbye. <laughs>